song we're doing today. Well, so here we go again. Back within the pocket, in the studio. Uh, today we're going to do a classic, a Philadelphia classic called Disco Inferno. That was originally cut uh, by uh, Baker Harrison Young Productions at Sigma Sound. Uh, I don't remember the exact year, but it was quite a while ago. Uh, it was um, Ronnie Baker on bass, uh, Earl Young on drums, uh, Norman Harris on guitar, me on guitar, Bobby Eli on guitar, Ron Kersey uh, on, on keyboards, and I believe Cotton Kent. And I think Ron Kersey was the primary writer of this track. So, uh, uh, so he, I'm sure he made plenty of money for plenty of years. This, I, think, I think Disco Inferno, when, when you look back, it's kind of ironic, but I think Disco Inferno was probably the biggest record that ever came out of Philadelphia, much to, I'm sure, Gamble Huff's dismay. But, but Disco Inferno, without a doubt, and, and because of Saturday Night Fever, yeah. just, just surpassed everything else that ever came out of Philadelphia. So fortunately, I was lucky enough to be on it. And in fact, I was lucky enough to be leader of the session. So, what, um, what do you remember from that session? Uh, well, it was, it was not unlike a lot of others. We were cutting a bunch of things that day for the Tramps, and this was just one of them. And uh, we got done, and, and as, as was the habit of the Philadelphia Rhythm Section, after we got done cutting the track, we would go into the control room and listen to the playback. And you could always tell which ones were going to be the hits. You, I mean, you could tell even without any vocals or anything, you could tell which ones were going to be the hits. So. What, um, when, you, uh, when, you, when you saw Saturday Night Fever for the first time, I'm sure you've seen it, what mm -hmm. did you think when you saw the track in there? Oh, I was extremely pleased. <laughs> I was very happy about that. It was it was interesting being in that Philadelphia thing, and I'll tell you why. Because we'd go into the studio and cut some tracks for Teddy Pendergrass or whoever the OJ's, whoever. And as the rhythm section, we wouldn't hear them again because uh, the next the next round would be the strings or the horns or the or the background vocals or the lead vocals, and then they would mix. And the next time I would hear it would be on the radio, and I'd be like, oh. Yeah, I remember that. That came out nice. <laughs> so it was, it was cool that way. That's a lot different than how you're recording now, with like with this project. Yeah. Um, how do you think it's going to come out today? Like, what are your expectations for the track as opposed to the original? Well, I'm hoping we rock it up a little bit more. I mean, the track was great, and it was great then, and it's great now, but uh, we need to do, I think we need to take it to the next level, personally. <laughs> um, so you've, you've had this track in your arsenal for, what, you know, 30 years, 40 years, mm, whatever? Something like that. Um, have you ever thought, like, oh, I'm going to re-record this? No, I've never thought about it. And you know what's interesting? People say to me, well, you played on Backstabbers, so you probably know that inside and out, right? And I'm like, well, not really. I mean, I played it once, you know what I mean, the day we cut it, and, and probably never again since then. So it's not like people think just because you cut it, you're going to know this track. You played it once, and then the next day you played something else. So that's an interesting uh, phenomenon. What's it like uh, as a, you know, as a session guy, um, when you're playing live, I mean, I know you do, you play live and all too, but what's it like as a session guy when you have all these different tracks that are coming at you day after day? Like, do you try to put different spin on it? Do you try to, or are you just doing what the producer wants? You mean in, when we were cutting all those things? Even now when you do stuff. I mean, you do well, I, I, well, you got, you got, you got to go by what the producer wants, but you want to hopefully add your own, your own signature to it. So, and, and each, each song makes you think differently. So you, you, you never really get to the point where you're doing the same thing on every song. What, um, what do you think about the guys you're playing with today? Oh, they're phenomenal. The best you can get. This is so much fun, this In the Pocket project. With Daryl and, Dar uh, Darren and, uh, Dallin and, 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 Start that over. So what do you think about the guys you're playing with today? <laughs> this is going to be a blast. I mean, the, the, this, this project that Dallin and David put together is uh, unbelievable. It's the best players in town at this point. And uh, it's just been a huge, a huge amount of fun. So I'm really looking forward to it again. This is a, the second thing I've cut with them. Okay, I'm gonna. This is not for this video. This is just to have as an extra piece because I think I want to do something for YouTube. Mm -hmm. Tell me what it's like when you're playing live and you're play, with this group and you're playing with Tommy and you're you guys just are going at it. Uh, let's <laughs> talk about let's say workout for example. Yeah, well that that was like an open invitation to me to really sort of like start a little guitar battle, and. Uh, I think the first time I did it with him was at it was at uh, XPN at one of those in the pocket shows, and I think he was a little surprised at first when I came up because I came over to him and he like did a double take and I was like, "Come on, man, are you ready?" <laughs> and he's like, "Okay." <laughs> and John Lilly, he wants to, everybody wants to get in on it. It's a lot of it, it. Just it just and I think it, I think people enjoy watching that. So they definitely do. Um, tell me about uh, I guess the studio we're in today. Have you ever played here before? No. Mm -mm, it's my first time, and um, uh, it's, it's, I, I heard the sound he got on David already, so I think we're going to be in good shape. It sounds phenomenal. What, um, 
What do you know about about Phil? Uh, just just some of his history. You know, I mean, I don't think we I, we might have met somewhere back along the road. Uh, but I don't know that much. Not know that much about. Him. I know he's done a lot of things. He had Rough House Records, which was a huge, a huge thing. So I know. I know he's. I know he knows what he's doing. What um? What are you playing today? What guitar? What amp? You I'll probably use the same guitar that I played on the original, the on the original Disco Inferno. It's a 1963 Stratocaster. Can I go get that? Or can we go get that and you can talk about it a little bit? Sure. Okay. So tell me about that guitar. So right here is my pride and joy. This is my 1973 Stratocaster. <laughs> This fellow's been on 38 gold and platinum albums, and it's been on the road with me with many, many people, and uh, I'm just extremely uh, proud of it and very attached. So show me, can you pick it up and show me where the John Lennon order well, Do you want me to talk about that? Sure. So anyway, we rolling? Yeah. So anyway, uh, 1972 or 73, we, I was with the Chambers Brothers, uh, and, um, uh, and in fact, in that band at that time was the drummer from Parliament Funkadelic, Jerome Braley. And we were, we, we were on the Mike Douglas show with uh, John and Yoko as co-hosts. And uh, between two songs, the Chambers came up and did two songs. And in the middle, John Lennon came over uh, and had a canvas that he was interested in having everybody sign because he was going to give it to charity. And so we all signed that and everybody signed everything. And then John came by and I said, John... Would you be willing to sign my guitar? And he said, oh, sure, sure, I'd be happy to. So he signed it right here. And you can see it's no longer there. <laughs> so he signed it. And then afterwards, Yoko came up and she said, oh, you like me signed too? I said, no, 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 that's okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. I don't think so. So so that was on here for a long time. but, And everybody said, you really should, you know, you're a thane over it or something. And, and I'm 23 years old. I'm like, eh, that's, that's all right. I'm sure it'll probably be there i'm not going to worry about it and sure enough it wore off but uh i know it's there so <laughs> very cool That's a good one. Just tell me about uh when you first recorded the track um what was it like when you went into the control room what was your, your well follow -up on it? basically this this was the case a lot of times in philadelphia what would happen is you'd be out in the, in the room cutting the track and you'd go back in and listen to the playback, and everybody would know immediately if it was a hit or not. I mean, you could hear it, and we'd all just look at each other and say, oh, that's a smash. And so that was what happened with this. We heard the track, and we were like, okay, man, this will this is going to definitely work. So we knew. Cool. I think I'm good. Okay. Thanks, man. Thank <laughs> you. 